pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Barry Lamb, who's the fourth uh, speaker in this year's ARIS series on aesthetics. Uh, Professor Lamb received his bachelor's degrees in uh, philosophy and English from UC Irvine, uh, followed by a PhD in philosophy at Princeton University. Uh, he's currently an associate professor of philosophy uh, at Vassar College, and he's been there since 2006. His early research interests were focused on um, epistemology and the philosophy of language, uh, but more recently he's been interested in the intersection of philosophy with um, political, moral, and uh, public policy issues. He's received various honors, um, including the Humanities Writ Large Fellowship from Duke University and the Whiting Public Engagement Fellowship. Uh, Professor Lamb is really focused on disseminating knowledge through narrative audio platforms, and accordingly, um, he's the creator and producer of the popular podcast, Hi-Fi Nation, which uses tangible stories to introduce uh, thought-provoking philosophical questions. Uh, given that uh, telling a compelling story is central to what all of us do in communicating um, our scientific findings, we're very much looking forward um, to hearing uh, your thoughts on aesthetics and ethics of nonfiction storytelling. So I'll, I'll turn it over now and I'll adjust the lighting just a little bit. Thanks. All right, this is going to be essentially a kind of a, uh, a meta talk. It's about how I have to think about making a podcast. Being an academic, can you hear? Is this a, okay, being an academic, uh, just like a lot of you, we're trained to write research papers, do research and write research papers. Even in philosophy, we do research um, and have to present it in a certain way. Um, so when I had to branch out and do um, something that was more uh, public engaging, uh, popularizing, if you will, I had to think a long, long and hard about how to do that and how other people had did that. And this is sort of what, I, what I've been able to come up with. Uh, the, the writer Michael Lewis is, uh, for those of you, you guys know Michael Lewis, right? Uh, Moneyball, uh, the, the Big Short. Um, anyways, Michael Lewis was uh, writing about Kahneman and Tversky, the Nobel winning economist, Daniel Kahneman. And it was the first time he had to delve into academic literature. So he had to read it um, and study it and then write a book about it. And he had this to say in, in the book that he wrote about, about academic writing in particular. He wrote, the readers of academic papers in the mind's eye of their authors are at best skeptical and more commonly hostile. The writers of these papers aren't trying to engage their readers, much less give them pleasure. They're trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> and you're laughing because that's exactly right. right? That's exactly right. This is a good characterization of sort of those of you who are together writing an academic paper. Um, the, the first thing that occurs to you is not, will they like it? Or will it give them pleasure? Will it give them joy? It's more like, what will they say? Right? That is an objection problem right? <laughs> with what it is that we're putting forward. Um, and um, and that, so this is what was his observation. What's, what's an apt observation? It's definitely true of philosophical work. And um, so there are different diagnoses of what the problem is with academic work. And by that, I mean writing, lectures, the kind of thing that we put out there. Uh, one is that it's bad writing, right? Um, and uh, you know, Steven Pinker, who's uh, who's written a whole style manual aimed for academics, has says that the problem is 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 bad writing. Um, I don't think that's the problem at all. Although I do think that is a problem, right? I don't think that's it's the problem. And mostly it's because I read a very interesting um, uh, little story that the writer Adam Hochschild uh, gave um, when I was reading up on um, you know, the difference between different kinds of writing. And the story is that he went home and he had a niece who was studying to be an architect, right? And he asked, and she, she mentioned something like, well, for building design, there's the architect and there's the engineer. And he says, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between architect and engineer? And she said, um, well, let me just actually quote, an architect is the person who plans what the skyscraper is going to look like from the outside and inside. An engineer is the person who makes sure it doesn't fall down, <laughs> right? And Hochschild said that um, he thinks of what we consider good writing. Like in your fields, you probably have good researchers, and there's probably like a few that are good writers. Like, oh, that's a good writer in chemical engineering and material sciences. Right? Maybe one or two of them out there. Um, and in philosophy, it's the same way, by the way. We write for a living, but if you had to put, like, who are the good writers, you'd probably have less than a handful. Right? And, and Hochschild said, well, the good writers, the good writing, that's the architecture. That's actually not the engineering. That's what he said. He said, when we characterize what's good writing, we think about something like what's quotable. Right? What are the good sentences, the good words, the good metaphors? 
And the way he put it is, the sparkle in the prose in the appearance. Right? Uh, the good engineering, on the other hand, well, as um, um, Hashal put, wrote, um, on the other hand, is um, the inner structure, whatever that is. And I noticed that actually it, it isn't just architecture that has this in interesting engineering versus architecture distinction. A lot of creative disciplines seem to have it, right? There's a difference between a nutritionist and a chef, right? A nutritionist is make sure, is someone who makes sure that you'll survive and thrive on a diet. A chef makes sure it tastes good, right? And looks good, right? That's a good, that's an interesting difference. You have the producer and the director, right? The person who makes sure the movie comes together, the producer, and the person who makes the artistic choices in the way that the actor is supposed to be you know, moving their face in a particular scene, right? And something that's closer to my heart, because uh, I, I come from carpentry and woodworking, the finished carpenter and the framing carpenter. So those of you who know who have any experience building, the framing carpenter is the person who builds the walls and the frame around the doors. The finished carpenter is the person who puts the trim around the edges, right? And Hawkshaw's observation is, a piece of writing can sparkle a plenty from one paragraph to the next. You can have a great, well-written piece of a journal article in a, I don't know, Journal of Chemical Engineering or something like that. Um, but if the inner, inner engineering isn't there, our attention wanders. So there's these examples of well-written things that aren't engineered for engagement, right? And I think of academics who do great research and write well there. They're still not doing the kind of thing that Michael Lewis is doing. <laughs> Right? when he writes one of his books that gets turned into a best-selling movie. And of course, you have things the other way around. You have things that are engineered for engagement very, very well that are just really poorly written. Right? And in fact, if I had to look back in the past 20 years and pick out what I think was, I don't even know how to think, there might be evidence for this, what are the two best-selling pieces of writing uh, that have sold the most in the last 20 years, there are two things that um, linguists and literary scholars think are the most atrociously written things. Of course, I'm talking about The Da Vinci Code and Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> uh, so the linguist, Jeffrey Pullen, had this to say about The Da Vinci Code. Brown's writing is not just bad, it's staggeringly, clumsily, thoughtlessly, almost ingeniously bad. So I just like, I didn't know, I actually haven't read The Da Vinci Code, but I was like, look, you could, it's like a sport on the internet, people like picking out lines <laughs> from The Da Vinci Code. So I just chose one. Um, I don't know how great it is, but I said, this is an example of something that's like, look, whatever is the inner engineering of Dan Brown, it's surprisingly effective, right? But like, then you have sentences like, Physicist Leonardo Vitra smelled burning flesh and he knew it was his own, right? Um, people said that's really bad. I don't think that's that bad. I mean, I guess it's not funny. That, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, there's Fifty Shades of Grey, which um, I tried to choose a quote from that, too. But, like, <laughs> um, so I had to find, like, the most PG, you know, like, version, right? Because, obviously, there's, but there's endless examples there. So this is the most PG sentence that people said is just a atrocious sentence from that. I feel the color in my cheeks rising again. It must be the I must be the color of the communist manifesto. Um, that was the beginnings of a titillating scene, I would imagine. Right? But look, the point is, you can have something that's engineered for engagement and pleasure, the kind of things that Michael Lewis was talking about, talking about and, poor, and have poor architecture. You can have things that are um, engineered poorly for engagement, but have great architecture. And so I think the problem is with the engineering and not with the architecture of uh, public engagement. And that's because academic work, academic journal writing, talks, even interviews between academics, whatever it is that it's our output, poster presentations, it's not engineered to do the same things that somebody like Michael Lewis's books are engineered to do, right? What they're engineered to do, our work, is I'm going to say epistemic justification, right? Epistemic justification is just this vocabulary word in philosophy that has to do with um, we're, pr we're trying to justify that the thing that we're writing is true, right? Is correct, should be accepted as knowledge, should be put forward in the literature as a piece of discovery, a piece of knowledge that um, we want on the record. Because it's engineered for that purpose, we're obsessed with methods, <laughs> we're obsessed with evidence, 
We're obsessed with problems or possible objections. The target audience is reviewer two, right? Some of you might not know what that means. Like there's this running joke that like there's two reviewers of your peer review journals, and reviewer two is always like got a list of problems right, with your article, right? And when we are doing our work, it's engineered towards overcoming the problems that the most hostile reviewer might have to the presentation of it. Or at least that's true of philosophy. I don't know if it's true in your field. As opposed to the kind of thing that Michael Lewis is doing, right? Which um, the, the, it's engineered for essentially aesthetic aims, right? Words like engagement, which just means holding someone's attention for a long time, at the same time giving them pleasure, giving them joy. These are like um, essentially aesthetic reactions and evaluations. And as a result, it's sensitive to boredom, right? It's sensitive to inattention. It's sensitive to incomprehensibility, right? If somebody can't follow you, they cannot, can, they do not want to continue to engage, and, um, and when they do, um, they are bored by it, right? The target reader is more like something like a consumer. Uh, the primary aim is actually almost literally extracurricular versus curricular. So, so what we do in the academy is curricular, and that's supposed to be something that who some, has to make a choice as to what to do with their time, they're gonna choose this. Right? And what is that? What is it that it's engineered um, to, to do? It's to do this. Um, how do you, as an academic, whose primary aim has always been the first kind of um, epistemic justification, the first kind of engineering goal, um, try to popularize the thing that's you know, engineered towards um, one goal with this other goal, engagement, pleasure, and joy? Right? This is the thing, this is sort of the dilemma that I was faced with. And so, um, you know, what is it that Dan Brown and E.L. James and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, what is essentially the kind of thing that they do, that what they're engineered at doing that academics don't do, but that holds people's attention? And the first, there's two things I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the first is that, well, what they do is essentially engineer by way of story, not by way of truth, right? So what I mean by truth is nothing special. You just have a claim you want to make, and then you're trying to justify that claim. Right? But that's not what's going on in these, um, in, in these other um, popular pieces of writing, pieces of production. Um, so the first observation is that if you look at the bell curve of human beings, the, kind, the population that's engaged with and like the kind of thing that we do is small. It's like on this, this end of the curve. Right? So we are good at it, um, we are interested in it, and even at that point, we're not that interested in it. <laughs> like, like in our own field, we're interested in it, but when like, somebody's talk is coming in, and like, I don't, I don't know anything about chemical engineering, but like, if it was, um, so if I, if I work on crystals, <laughs> and, and, and the talk is on, it's like something else that's not crystals. Viruses. Viruses? <laughs> Viruses, I'd be like, Right? You, you try your best to follow, and you're in that top 0.01% that finds that really engaging. Versus what are most people engaged with? Storytelling, right? Like, that's sort of what everything is geared toward. That's why the best sellers are the best sellers, even though they're crappily written. And that's why Marvel, it makes so much more money. And that documentary you made about the discovery of the latest crystalline structure of blah, blah, is not that popular, right? Not even close. Um, so what are stories? I, I, this is just like 11th grade, right? It's something with a character, something with a plot. Rising action, something with a conflict, something that has stakes. Um, changing fortune over time, I actually think this is an essential feature of stories, and it's something that has suspense. Um, there are studies like something like 65% of human speech is gossip, and I, probably that's even true of chemical engineers. Maybe it's not 65, maybe it's 50. But like, if you think about the sheer amount of time you're like, communicating, like gossiping is essentially storytelling about stuff that's happening, like you know, about people around you and so forth. Um, the, another thing that we've known for about 40 years is that the way humans process information is story-driven. You're not like this because you're a scientist, but you all know that most people, when you're given an anecdote, weight it way more than data, right? Like you can have data, like really good data about the reliability of 
Honda Accords, right? right? And it's like, oh yeah, so like the probability that this one is a lemon is like, like, like 0.003%, and you're like, here's the data. And then somebody comes up to you and goes, my cousin died in an Accord. <laughs> like he was putting gas in his tank and it blew up in his face. <laughs> Third degree burns and then he died. And it, like that kind of thing, most people way like like think about it for a second, right? There's like what three million accords and one person died, right? So it's one over three million is the weight that you should put on evidence from an anecdote. But that's not how people work psychologically. Like the anecdote has a huge impact on how they like if they're going to go buy a car, they're going to be like like most people will be like. I don't know about the accord, <laughs> right? Um, that's, that's been a pretty well-established cognitive phenomenon. So um, the power of story is, the power of story to change your mind, but the power of story to, for attention um, is uh, well-established. There's, um, there's a famous uh, experiment that takes only about a minute 30. Um, so I'm gonna ask for a couple of volunteers. So this is a 1944 experiment, Heider and Simmel. Um, you're just supposed to watch it for a minute 30 and then describe to me what happened, right? And this is an example of just how wired for story human beings are. So I'm going to push play and then I'm going to ask for just like one or two volunteers just to describe what it is that happened, okay? And then what happened with the kid and the adults? Well, the kid went with uh, one of the adults, and then the other one get nuts. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have a different narrative they want to attach to? Yeah. I feel like this is just like an abridged version of like a slasher movie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like a slasher movie? Yeah. Okay. Like a couple of teens find a cabin in the woods, and, and then, you know, the slasher goes crazy. And just, they get out. Whoa. You know. <laughs> they get you all out. know that it's just triangles yeah. and circles. <laughs> On the screen, right? Right? Like, really, the thing that happened was, like, you have some coordinates, and this is what the triangle did, and this is what the circle did, right? Right? But, like, no. What, what have you done? You've ascribed mental states to the individuals. You probably, as you were watching, ascribed social relationships. Who has power over whom? Who might be bullying whom? Who might be intending to harm whom? Who's hiding from somebody else? Who left with, like, like things like that, right? Um, uh, what else you, are you ascribing, right? You're ascribing a rise in action, right? A conflict, right? A fall in action, like th those kinds of things, right? I mean, that's how wired for story you are, right? Just seeing interactions among geometrical figures has a rich structure underneath it, right? Um, and so, okay, engineering for that kind of structure, um, I think, is the first step um, in what I call the popularization of certain ideas in philosophy, like finding, in, imposing a structure like that, right, on what is otherwise something that we consider epistemic, finding the truths about something. Um, okay. Um, so, what is the structure of a story? <coughs> Sorry. Um, right, so I mentioned character, plot, conflict, states. Changing fortune over time, changing fortune over... <coughs> Am I losing my voice in the middle um, Chain and Fortune Over Time is something that Kurt Vonnegut has a really cool video about. 
Um, look it up on YouTube, the Kurt Vonnegut story structure. And, um, and he said, all stories have the following feature. You just take a graph, good fortune and good fortune, from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. And you pretty much have every story just with a different curve on it, right? So like Cinderella is like, bad fortune, bad fortune. Things get better, things get better. Oh, that's bad. And then you go to the end, it's like happy ending, right? Um, so almost every story, he says, you can impose this kind of structure on. So um, Pixar, <coughs> this is the Pixar structure. Pixar says, this is the story structure they like. Life is normal. It's not good or bad. You're just going about your business. Then something happens. Right? Um, a new toy gets introduced that interrupts your hierarchy. Um, a sleek robot drops in from the sky that all of a sudden you could fall in love with, but then it shuts down, right? Um, so um, leading to a series of adventures, there's a bottom to the misfortune, and then you slowly climb up until you're redeemed at the end, right? So um, what does this tell you? <clears throat> it tells you that we like to follow uh, changes in fortune over time as an essential part of how we understand. So what are the things that drive the changes over time, it's conflicts, right? Conflicts essentially between people, all right? So my, my task then was to try to find the philosophy in this. It's weird, I'm just losing my voice as this is going. <coughs> um, so my idea was, can I find stories whose conflict are essentially philosophical conflicts, right? Conflicts that they only arise and change somebody's fortune over time because uh, people are making assumptions about something that are fundamentally different from each other and that philosophers have talked about and discussed and have arguments about. Uh, uh, so I think Mahesh put out the Name of God episode. Um, the Name of God episode is the story of Arusha Hawkins, who was the first um, a uh, tenured black <coughs> professor at, um, at Wheaton College. She was fired for making a Facebook post, post essentially saying that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. The college decided that it was incompatible with her statement of faith, that that was, because um, it's an evangelical Christian college, is an evangelical Christian, <coughs> and she was let go from her job. And so you have Lurisha's story, um, I'm not, I, don't, I might not have the time, so I'm not going to play that right now. Um, but So what I did was structure, this U-shape is the structure, the engineering of the philosophy with the, um, with the story. So the way that I thought about it was um, the straight line is the Risha story, and that's the line that's going to have this change in fortune over time. It's going to have the conflict. It's going to have the um, characters. It's going to have the low point and then a high point, that line, right? And what I'll do is I'll run Orisha's story right up until the point that the listener wants to find out what happens to her, right? And use what the cognitive scientists call need for closure, which is the desire to uh, answer a question, like solve a mystery, to dip down into the actual sociology, the actual philosophy behind how, it, how do people argue about whether two religions worship the same God? I mean, like, that's a, that's, a comp <clears throat> that's a complex philosophical, theological, sociological question that there's been a lot of research about. Um, that goes in the middle, right? And by the end of that, the listeners should have a very good understanding of the intellectual issues that go into what makes one side right versus another side not right in, in this conflict. So they have a better understanding of the story and the conflict behind it, just in time to finish the story, right? Um, and so, I don't know, do you guys want to hear little bits of it? Okay, um, so Larisha's. I had this calculus, like, on Facebook, the posts of mine that got the most attention is perhaps 10% of my Facebook, right? Maybe 150 people will see this even, and maybe they'll like it, maybe not. 
If I had any idea that those would have gone viral or if anyone would have really seen it beyond my handful of Facebook friends, I would have taken a better selfie. A scholarship? Oh, come on. Play. Jesus is a, a figure in the Jewish tradition. Jesus, by contrast, is a very important figure for Muslims. First off, the Quran says that Jesus was born of Mary, who's a Christian. Uh, except that for Muslims, it doesn't make Jesus divine. This makes Jesus extraordinary. <coughs> Mashiach in the Hebrew is Masihia in Arabic, a dozen times in the Quran, Jesus is called the Messiah. And if you ask Muslims who is the Messiah, they say, well, it's Jesus, because that's his title in the Quran. Christianity and Islam share the same creation story. They share the same prophetic history up through Jesus. They share the same story of the origin of Jesus <coughs> as being from a virgin birth through Mary, another very important <coughs> character in Islam. Jesus performed miracles and was the anointed one of God or the Messiah. They disagree with Christians about the divinity of Jesus. Okay, so that's the scholarship. Tell the backstory, do some philosophy of language about when two things refer to the same thing. And then the end of the story, <clears throat> what Ira Glass calls the moment of reflection, this is a time when um, you cut in people's emotional reactions to the events. Right? For some reason, that's a really powerful thing. When people listen, it's the moments of reflection that make people have a driveway moment. You know, you go to the driveway and you're listening and you don't want to get out of the car until it's going over. Right? And it's, it's usually at these moments, right? It's been traumatic. The whole experience was traumatic, to be quite honest. It's taken a toll of my body, on my emotions, I would say on relationships, just because it has to, just because it's testing and trying. It's strengthened and improved relationships, but also there's this time where I just can't be there for my friends in the way I wish I could. I am forever now linked to the Muslim community, not just nationally, but internationally. And I was in Turkey this summer, and it was an overwhelming experience. When people found out, and I'm talking about mostly Syrian refugees in Turkey, their response was, wow, you would do that to stand with us. OK. <clears throat> so the other thing, I hope you noticed, that I did besides just giving the intellectual content a story structure, and embedding it in the story in such a way as to create some understanding of the conflict within it is the use of music, right? That's something else. So that's, you need to audio and video. Um, probably you're not going to do this in your writing, but please listen to <laughs> track four. While <laughs> 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 I'm reading this article, because like, that's how I wrote it. Um, probably you're not going to do it. I, I think you should. <laughs> um, so what is the power of music, the aesthetic power of music in this context? Well, one thing to notice, <clears throat> I hope the voice doesn't go. One thing to notice about music is that like stories, um, they, are one, they are one of the objects of aesthetic appreciation that are essentially temporal, right? So paintings, sculptures, right? Um, even a delicious bite of food are not essentially temporal, right? The idea is you can like, like like at a certain moment, kind of grasp its full you know, aesthetic features. But stories are not that way, and neither is music. And I think it's not um, a coincidence that in our audio and in our video um, stories, we have to have music, right? Because it actually contributes to the overall experience that we have. Um, they unfold over time, and the quality of the change, the quality of a piece of music and the quality of the story depends on how it changes over time. Right? You can have um, uh, really good moments in a piece that is overall just horrible, depending on how things are structured and so forth. Um, just to sort of illustrate the difference, the power of music and the difference in music before we talk about it, I want to show a scene from a film that is, when you watched it, and probably most of you did watch this, um, you saw it with music. So here's a scene. That same scene without music, right? And I want to get some volunteers to say, 
How does it feel without the music? This is the end to The Force Awakens. <laughs> There is sound, by the way. It's just not done. I can actually do the slideshow now from here because I don't think there's any problems. Um, volunteers? Why the giggles? It's so awkward. Awkward. <laughs> awkward is a great word. It's like a hiker going upstairs to find someone. Yeah. It's a, anything? It's stirring up there. <laughs> no. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Wait a minute here. Um, uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's uncomfortable, right? Um, so there is no non-diegetic music in this, in this, um, sorry, where's my slide, right? Non-diegetic music is um, music that is not in the world of the people in the film, right? So uh, in the cantina scene, that's diegetic music, right? It's like they're playing music and everybody else in the world of the scene, right? Non-diegetic music is for us. Right? It's, the, it's part of our experience of their world, not their experience. Um, um, there's, what, what does it do? It creates movement, right? And just like stories, they require a resolution. It creates moods. Most importantly in this scene, it allows for silence, no dialogue, without discomfort. <laughs> right? um, suspension without discomfort. And that's important because the reason why you would want to have a moment of silence without discomfort on our part is you want us to be reacting a certain way, right? All right, now I'm gonna play the scene in its original. And, whoops, and what I want you to do is not just watch it, but listen to it, and listen, this is what I want you to listen for. Um, I want you to listen for volume, right? I want you to listen for uh, how rich it is, how many instruments are playing at the same time, right, and the changes in that. And then finally, I want you to listen for changes in the theme, right, changes in what's being played, right? So um, in the beginning, it's going to be this do 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 do, right? And then that doesn't stay with that theme for, for very long. So for those three, volume, um, theme, and instrumentation, right? So how rich the sound is.
Volunteers, what Still did the music do? Huh? Still makes it awkward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not as much. <laughs> All right. So did you did you guys listen for the what I was trying to get you to like? So um, how would you carry it at the beginning of this? Like first thing, right? It's clearly. I mean, what's the music doing? Right. Remind you of Star Wars. Huh? Remind you of Star Wars. Yes. Remind you of Star Wars. Yes, it does remind you of Star Wars. But which theme? Though? Which theme in particular? The Jedi Force theme, right? The Jedi Force theme comes in at a very precise moment, um, and it comes in after the. So there's, so there's like a certain there's a, there's the searching theme, right? The climbing the steps theme, right? Then there's the seeing of Luke part of the theme. Then there's a crescendo there, and then it stops, right? And then he does his, you know, uh, his hood thing. And there's a pause, and then it's the lightsaber that brings the Jedi theme together. And that's how it ends, right? So the, the, the Jedi theme ends with like, sort of like this helicopter going behind the whole scene, right? The thing that's super awkward in the, in the beginning was like, <laughs> just Ray standing there, right? <laughs> just like holding it out, and it's like way too long to be holding. And it's too, it's too slow of a reveal, like in reality. But what the, what the, um, so you know, judging just from the side AB comparison, that um, the A structure is um, the, the actual things happening on the screen are not the things that are reflective of what the story is supposed to be. Because when you see it without the music, you recognize that's just not the correct interpretation of what's happening. But with the music, you see a lot of things that are supposed to be interpreted. Right? And what is that supposed to be? Essentially, th there's many elements there, I'm simplifying, but Ray's state of mind, Luke's state of mind, right? So the psychology of the characters in the scene. And then finally, the use of this Jedi's motif, the use of motifs in the film is famously, you know, it goes back to Wagner, right? It's supposed to be the thing that you are doing to connect a moment with other moments, right? Like the reason why you have a motif, the, the reason why you have the Jedi theme in a certain place is so that you can connect it with all the other places you've heard the Jedi theme and all the other movies and the whole saga, right? And that's supposed to be the moment that, like, Jedi-ness <laughs> and what the Jedi is supposed to represent in the story is all comes crashing to you. That's all going on to prevent the awkwardness, but that's exactly what the story is supposed to be doing at that point. And you're only told that because of the score. Uh, okay. Um, how much time do I have? Another 10, 15 minutes. 10-15 minutes? Okay, good. Um, the very first place that you, one of the very first places you hear the Jedi theme is all the way back in the New Hope. Um, 
it's gonna, there's going to be a big Star Wars section. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, so this is the part of um, where I want to illustrate um, different modes of music and the way they communicate different um, moods and movement. Um, so this is the binary sunset scene uh, in The New Hope. It's one of the first places you hear the Jedi theme in all of its richness. Hopefully it'll play through this time around. And I'm going to give you another A-B test. Right? Um, I want you to think about Luke's mood and in the story structure where on the fortune graph we're supposed to be. High, low, right? In, in the story, in this scene. the story supposed to be? On a farm in Tatooine. Right? <laughs> and, um, does anybody guess get a sense of loss that's happening in this scene? Right? So, so we're supposed to feel loss. We're supposed to feel sadness. We're supposed to, you know, there, 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 it's a big moment of reflection. Okay, so here's the same scene with the same scoring done in the major key rather than the minor key. Sorry. <laughs> I know you want to hear that again. There's, there's, there's just, there's, it's just an amazing, um, just an amazing, like, creative people on YouTube who have, like, rescored parts of movies with the opposite keys, <laughs> like major versus minor. All right, what's the mood now? <laughs> triumph? Yeah, triumph, hope. I made it. I'm here on Tatooine. I'm about to perform it. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just like, like fantastic, right? This is like the end of the movie, right? right. Good. I mean, there's the power of music. The, the difference between the major and the minor key is enough to evoke a particular sense that you're trying to convey with the, with the scene. And um, this, by the way, works with ideas, <laughs> right? You can, surprisingly, not just with stories, but it works with the presentation of uh, Themes in somebody's like description of things. Like if you listen to the podcast, you, you notice this thing. Like I look for puzzling music in the minor key. I look for triumphant music in like the major key. Right? I look for instrumentation in rises. I like try to engineer um, my way out of boredom, but essentially to impose on a particular presentation of an argument of the history, of the prophetic history between Christians and Muslims and things like that, um, a kind of movement, mood, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now I'm gonna move on to the last part of my talk, which is, is that okay, <laughs> right? Because we have these values, these epistemic values uh, in academia. We strike for truth, we offer evidence for it, that's the goal. Aesthetic values like imposing particular kinds of moods, movements, um, major versus minor keys, you know, the, major, the difference between just that, story structure, um, does it sacrifice that? Well, there's a long tradition in filmmaking that actually says it does, and, and outside of filmmaking too. So famously, um, some of you know the Blair Witch Project, I don't know if everyone knows that. So the Blair Witch Project was this attempt by directors to um, sell to the public that this is a true life documentary, <laughs> like this happened. 
we discuss, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's not the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> uh, and they did, and when they did it, they decided the only way we're gonna convince the public is if we don't use non-diegetic sounds. We don't use a narrator, and we don't use any score. Because that's what truth is. That people will buy the truth when it doesn't have sound. Um, and music. Um, Michel Brault, the filmmaker, comes from the um, uh, tradition that says that true documentary, sorry, cough drop, is, um, is, is real, right? realism. Like, truth is of the utmost uh, importance. Music is an interpretation. It's the interpretation of the producer, the filmmaker, creates a certain impression. <coughs> Documentary is not a place for impression. It's realism. Music has no place there. Um, it's not just music, but it is music. It's the entire process of editing something that's different, like in the storytelling, in the storytelling sense, um, requires you to play fast and loose with what actually happened. And you don't do it just through music and narration, although you definitely do it. Those are the two most powerful place, places. You also do it with editing, right? Here's a scene I'm gonna show you from March of the Penguins. You can pay attention to the, the music that's being used, but also the narration and um, how it's edited together. Okay. From now on, the couple has but a single goal, keeping their egg alive. The hungry mother must return at once to the sea to eat. But before she leaves, she must entrust the egg to his father. Some, young couples perhaps, are too impulsive or rushed. And within moments, their affair comes to an end. They can only watch as the ice claims their egg and the life within it. Partnership is now over. Okay. So, so that's a powerful scene from March of the Penguins. Um, in fact, this is years and years ago, so this might be new to some of you younger people. Um, now, after March of the Penguins came out, um, uh, it was very popular. It was very popular among a lot of people. But it's also very popular in the, in, in the uh, re religious evangelical community. Um, they read the film as a kind of pro-life, pro-family, kind of family unit, anti-abortion picture um, in, in many ways. And there were some arguments about that. Okay? But one of the things that I just want to point out about this scene <laughs> is that it depicts a certain event as happening. Right? But one thing you should know about it is that, number one, when you film penguins, you don't film the sound that they're making at the time. You can't. You can't put you, from far away. You kind of... You know, I think about when you're like, filming a sitcom, the mic has to be like literally right over you and you can't like stick a mic, hey penguin, make the sounds, and, like not interfere, right? So the sounds that you're hearing from the penguins are added in non-diegetically, actually, right, in this scene, right? First thing. Second thing, the egg breaking frozen, freezing scene was not the egg that was actually frozen. If you look carefully at the scene, that egg was behind the legs of one of the two parents, right? That was an egg that, I don't know how the filmmakers, they take an egg somewhere or something, but like, like in an isolated part of the glacier, filmed that as it was cracking, right? And of course, needless to say, that um, the music wasn't there, right? right? But it, um, so, the thing that is depicted as happening is not, did not happen the way that it's depicted as happening. Right? It's depicted as happening essentially as a moment of mourning. Right? Like, like that's how I think it's safe to describe it that way. Um, so, um, right? so, last part of the talk about the ethics of this kind of thing. 
Right? The addition of narration scoring in our diagenic sound, the imposing of an aesthetic structure to it's essentially research, reality, um, is not perfectly reflective of truth, of what's happening, the way things are. Um, so does that mean that epistemic value and aesthetic values are intention in the nonfiction narrative area? Well, you can think of a few answers to this, and I'm going to go through these very quickly, and we can discuss these, right? And the, 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 the first answer is yes, actually knowledge and truth are boring, and it's complicated, um, and when you popularize it by doing these other things to it, you're manipulating. Oh, I see, I don't know what, why this is doing that. Okay. Um, you're, you're manipulating, right, in a certain way. You're giving it a narrative, which it doesn't otherwise have. And um, aestheticized nonfiction, like one way to put it, is simple, right? It has good guys and bad guys. It's Manichaean, right, in that sense. Um, it's deception. Right? And people complain about Malcolm Gladwell this all the time, including researchers he cites. They say, look, he just got it wrong. It makes the story sound great, but he just didn't get the research right. And there's something to that, actually. Um, you have another view that says um, the epistemic values and aesthetic values are intention, but you can have a balance. Right? And if you balance it too far one way, it's propaganda. And if you balance it the right way, it's not propaganda, it's... Uh, the right way to get people to reflect on the truth and all that in the way that they can. And so one of the ways to, one way to put this is that, um, so I won't have time to show these clips, but Michael Moore documentaries, right? Uh, for those who know Michael, Michael Moore documentaries. Michael Moore documentaries um, are not the right like, uh, um, balance because number one, they're opinionated, right? Um, they don't present just facts in the tone. In fact, they're very blunt, right? Maybe I should show it. <laughs> so here's a, here's, a, here's a scene from Sicko, right? Just pay attention to the way he cuts and pay attention to the score, the, the music that he uses. She drove Washington insane. Do you really want the federal government to control your health care? You won't have the choice of your own doctor, yeah. government, and <laughs> less government. More government control. More government. And less control for you and your family. When your mom would get sick, she might talk to a bureaucrat instead of a doctor. This is a total mess, and it's about to get messier. Not this big bureaucratic socialist okay. plan that they have. Socialist takeover. Socialized medicine. What really amounts to a giant social experiment. <laughs> So that's a tone you could take, right? And in fact, Gladwell on his podcast takes that tone. Uh, and so according to this, is like, okay, that's too far. We can, we can see propaganda where, uh, where, uh, where it appears. It's like, like for, for instance, like the music that he uses is always really, really familiar and a little bit cartoonish, too. Um, and, and the cuts, like, so, and he actually tells us what he's supposed to be thinking about it. Um, I won't play this next clip. I love it, though. It's, it's, it's an Errol Morris movie, which he doesn't do that, right? Um, Errol Morris just has things play out. He doesn't have narrators, right? And even in this one where he's interviewing um, uh, Bob McNamara, Bob McNamara is trying to present some arguments, but hedges on all of them. And everything strikes us as nuanced, and complicated in the way that we typically think of research as being. Now, uh, because I don't have time, I'm just going to um, present a radical view about the ethics of this, right? Which is um, the view that says that um, balance, even ha handedness, the opposite of aesthetic is anesthetic, right? So, like anesthesia, right? Anesthetic language, right? This view says, I think I like this view is not an epistemic value. It's not a value that our work has just because that's how it sounds. Um, it's actually also an aesthetic value. Right? Here's one thing to think about. The, reason, the people who like Errol Moore's films as opposed to um, uh, uh, Michael Moore films, the people who like to watch PBS News as opposed to MSNBC or Fox News, uh, that's not just an that's not an epistemic value. It's not because PBS happens to be more true or better justified. Right? This piece says it actually is a certain aesthetic itself. 
right? Um, are, the people who are drawn to that kind of aesthetic right, find distasteful the other one. But it doesn't mean the other one is less true. Right? Because maybe, at least in some domains, uh, the truth or the facts right, uh, have an aesthetic to it that is strong, opinionating, maybe a mood like the minor key is the right way to present it because it is the truth of a certain idea. Right? It is a bit tragic. Right? And removing that is not an epistemic choice. It's not a choice that's, that because our values are such that we value truth. It's just an aesthetic one. Right? Maybe that's correct. Anyways, I'm going to stop here so leave some room for discussion. But thank you very much for coming and listening to it.